Ordinary love is a stretch. It's what we usually call love in Western culture. And, and we're in a strange position in relationship to love in Western culture. I mean, we've killed all the gods except for Aphrodite. In the Center for Integral Wisdom, I was privileged to found with um, my dear friends, uh, Sally Kempton, Ken Wilbur, and, and a number of other people. And we started the center for a simple reason. We're facing what we call the second shock of existence. The first shock of existence was the realization that there was death, right? Original death, you know, at the dawn of existence. And in response to the realization of death, meaning not just the bison might get me this afternoon, but the actual consciousness as we moved to horticultural and agrarian, we had a consciousness of death. We began to think about it. It wasn't just a biological fact, it became an existential fact. That's what we want to call the first shock of existence. That generated culture. That generated us moving inwards and actually forming all of human culture. If you fast forward, we've now come to what we might call the second shock of existence, which is that after all of our development, we could actually extinct ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we're facing two forms of existential risk, what I would call the death of humanity, and possibly the death of our humanity. And each one of those is a conversation, and we're working hard on each of those topics. Now, how do we respond to that? So if we cut through all of the governance issues and the infrastructure issues and the polarization issues and the multipolar traps and that, right, we cut through all of those issues, we get to something really simple. We don't have a shared story. We don't have a shared human story of value that allows us to overcome the global intimacy disorder and create coherence. And the generator function for existential risk is twofold, right? It's a failed story, a success story based on rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, which then generates an extraction model, which generates self-termination, which then generates not complex interrelated systems based on allurement, but complicated systems that are fragile. So, all that means that in order to actually engage the world in any serious way today, to actually step into where we are, we have to actually articulate what we're calling a universal grammar of value. And what that means and how that grammar of value allows for diversity within a larger meta framework, how that allows for what we call unique self symphonies, right? Instead of kind of a, you know, mono imposed kind of tyrannical system of value is actually the key, the key issue of our survival. If we can't create global coherence, we actually won't survive. And we can't create global coherence. That's the essence of what keeps me up day and night. We can't create global coherence unless we can create a shared global story that's rooted in inherent value, not contrived social constructions of reality. Something like that. Short answer. A, a new universe story, right? has or it answers questions so the universe the new universe story has to answer the question of where are we where are we means let me try and kind of cut through all the footnotes and i'm guilty of writing way too many footnotes in this lifetime so let's cut through for a second the new universe story asks answers the question of where are we where are we is there a welcome sign in cosmos is there a welcome home sign in cosmos is the universe fundamentally welcoming us inherently. Now, to answer that question, you've got to dive into physics and metaphysics and molecular biology and systems theory and evolutionary science and, of course, the great traditions. But that's the core question. If you strip everything else, else aside, and by the way, Einstein, who got a lot wrong outside of physics, and he kind of gets all this credit outside of physics, actually outside of physics is a very, very interesting man, but he was often an idiot, right? So in physics, he was great. But outside of physics, we have this strange thing. We give physicists credit outside of their field, which is a mistake, of course, because we reduce the world to it, and physicists are best at it problems. Therefore, we think they know about humanity problems. They don't. But, you know, Einstein, in this particular case, this is one of the cases he got it right, and a reporter corners him kind of at the end of a talk and says, what's the one question you'd like to have answered? And he said very beautifully, he said, is the universe friendly? And he was getting that welcome question, right? Right, very beautiful. Now, the corollary of a narrative of a universe 
is a narrative of identity, which is the second question. Not where am I, but who am I? Right? Who am I? What's my, what's my, am I a self? Am I not a self? What kind of self am I? Am I a separate self? Am I a, and so we've developed what we call unique self theory that's been kind of rapidly adopted, which is kind of what we think is the best answer. Well, let me correct that. The best response, it's not an answer, the best response to the question of who am I that integrates all of the leading edge validated insights of the pre modern, modern, and post modern period, right? Discounts their overreaches into a new, right, narrative of self. So you got to start with those first two narratives. From there, last two sentences, you got to get to a narrative of desire. Then you need a narrative of power. Then you need a narrative of community. Those five narratives are the frameworks, right? We are now living in a moment of failed frameworks. And since the human being always lives in inescapable frameworks, so we replace our failed frameworks with a faulty framework, with a corrupt framework, with a, and, and if I have a corrupt framework, corrupt meaning it, it's degraded in some essential way, what will emerge from it will be disastrous, which is what generates existential and catastrophic risk. Right? They're all traceable right, to the faults in the essential storylines in one of those five frameworks. That was a lot, but, but thank you for holding with me in it. But, but it made, you can begin to see that the general picture. And that, that's what we're interested in. We're really answered. We're interested in putting our attention on the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right, let's swallow culture whole to the best extent possible. I didn't understand it as well as best as we can without excluding pieces of culture. Right? We try and solve climate change. Climate change. Let's put a carbon tax, for example. Well, that'll destroy half of the world. We ignore externalities. We pick our value, ignore the other values. We place our attention in narrow sectors. You know, everything's interconnected. We know that. But what that means is, is that you can't solve one problem and externalize another one. You've got to get the gestalt of the entire system, be able to see, right? And that what keeps me working day and night is just trying to see and see, did I miss a piece? And then begin to see how does this all fit together? And then how do we get to second simplicity solutions? Meaning, what are the orienting or ordinating values that create a universal grammar of value that will generate, right, actually solutions that actually are appropriate and can actually take us into the future? Let's take narrative of self just briefly. So what's the best answer to the question of who am I? Okay. So let me see if I can do it in like, I don't know, five sentences. Let's summarize thousands of pages of diverse literatures and integrate them if we can into five sentences. Fair, here we go. Let's do it. Okay, so who are you? So you are an irreducibly unique expression, an irreducible, it's not reducible, not just cultural, psychological, or social. You're an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty and love desire. That is the initiating and animating energy and eros of all that is that lives in you as you and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again other than through you. And as such, you potentiate a unique set of capacities which foster unique gifts that allow you to address unique needs in your unique circle of intimacy and influence and to be an irreducibly unique configuration of intimacy unlike any that ever was, is, or will be. And that's your life. Wow. There's a footnote on every word, but actually you can say it in three or four sentences. You actually realize, wow, I am evolution. I'm a unique expression of the evolutionary process, right? Evolution becomes alive in me. Not that, not conscious evolution. My friend, Barbara, who was the co-president with me and Zach of the center for many years, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Mm -hmm. right? Barbara's awesome. And I miss her dearly every day. We talk five times a day and I miss her, you know, terribly. But Barbara talked about evolution coming awake in conscious evolution. And Barbara and I disagreed about this. And we came to a shared understanding towards the end of her life, which is conscious evolution doesn't mean that evolution becomes awake. Evolution was conscious when it did whatever consciousness means. It didn't do, I don't know, mitosis and meiosis, which every supercomputer we have couldn't generate exponentially, right? It wasn't unconscious when it did that. Right? Clearly, there's a, an intelligent consciousness that inheres in cosmos that is the will of the self-organizing universe inherently, you know, whatever that means and however that mystery unfolds itself. But conscious evolution means 
I become aware that my identity is I'm a unique configuration of the drive for wholeness and coherence and intimacy that is the movement that drives the evolutionary process. And all of a sudden I realize that evolution's not, I was sitting with my, my a wonderful man, Urban Laszlo, about six years ago in Tuscany. And we're talking about what moves evolution. So, so Urban talks beautifully about simplicity to complexity and it's more coherent. And, and that's true. But it's more than that. Coherence is just actually a word for intimacy. And intimacy means not just that we're close. Intimacy means that we have a shared identity in the context of otherness. Mm. Right? I was just not talking to Ike yesterday about, did he didn't tell you? Right. So I was, <laughs> maybe I wasn't. Okay. I just made that up. Okay. Right. So, so, so Ike and Andy, right. Right. Mark and Christina, right. My partner, right. So we have a shared identity. It's not just Ike and Andy who happen to be in a relationship. There's something called Ike and Andy. Right. But if Ike disappears or Andy disappears, it's not intimacy. It's not union. It's fusion. So intimacy is shared identity in the context of otherness. But it's relative otherness because underneath there's this basic union plus, plus, and see if this works for Ike and Andy, it works for Mark and Christina, plus mutuality of recognition, plus mutuality of pathos, we can feel each other, plus mutuality of value, and finally, plus mutuality of purpose. Now, here's the wild thing, Andy. That applies equally to a proton Right, yearning for an electron, even though they're wildly different sizes, and it's 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and they're allured to each other, and they're coming together in the space in between, relational space, because reality is relationships. That's its core. It's not that there are separate parts. The ontology of reality is relationship. So the proton electron comes together, they form a larger whole neutron, it's called an atom. And that's actually the movement towards shared identity. In the context of otherness, right? The proton, electron, neutron don't disappear, right? And there's a mutuality of recognition, plus they feel each other, actually. Whitehead called it prehension, right? This proto-touch allurement, plus the mutuality of value. Their value is to generate an atom, which then will create new attention spaces, which will actually move evolution forward, plus a clear mutuality of purpose. They have an intention. They have a telos. So wildly, I call this the intimate universe. I actually begin to understand that that which drives Mark and Christina and that which drives Ike and Andy, right? And Ike and Andy and all of their collaborators, because intimacy is not limited to romantic intimacy. There's many forms of intimacy. Wow, that begins to become interesting. We now have a universe story. That's a universe story. I'm now, a, we just said that universe story in seven minutes, right? Four minutes, whatever our time is, since I don't have my clock and my phone's on my clock, so I, I don't know what time it is. But wow, that's, I mean, be, and, and all of this is, where I'm talking the language of second simplicity. I mean, I've been thinking about this with, with a team of colleagues, Zach Stein and, you know, um, Daniel Schmachtenberg, who we worked together for years, and, and, and Ken Wilbur and Sally Kempton and, and Christina Kincaid, and, you know, and, and an enormous, you know, enormously talented group of, of thinkers. And we're, we're trying to get to what's underneath it all, right? Right? Thousands of footnotes, but how can we say it clearly so it becomes actually the ground of a shared story that's not mere conjecture, that's not fanciful. Now, last thing, if I don't get that I'm a unique self, as we've defined it, right? And you don't need, you don't need the whole definition in your head. You just get, I have an irreducible value. It's not just my talent. It's not the talent of my separate self. That's not unique self. It's not my Myers-Briggs stuff. It's got very little to do with that. It's the irreducible, unique quality of eros, intimacy, and desire that lives in me, as me, and through me, that never was, is, or will be ever again, that is self-validating, right? It's, it's inherently, right, self-evidently valuable. That sense of, without that, I can't help but fall into the pain of codependency. Because if I'm a separate self, which is how we define self and culture, and usually I'm a corrupted separate self, I'm a degraded separate self, which I call a false self, and how we talk about separate self and how we talk about false self is a broader conversation, but if my healthy separate self gets degraded, which always does, so I become some false version of myself with false core sentences and, and distortions of my self-understanding, and I'm traumatized you know, in all sorts of ways, well, then I've got to reach for wholeness. But where, do my, where am I going to reach? I'm going to reach to other separate selves, right? because maybe they'll somehow make me whole, which, of course, they can never do. right? And so I need to know that I'm a unique self, 
But and when I'm a unique self, here's the paradox. It's not that we're interdependent. That's an overused word. And it's not inaccurate. It just doesn't quite capture it. It's we actually all need each other. See, the problem with codependency is not need. Of course, we need each other. Right? To say I love you is to say I need you. And the most vulnerable thing to do in the world is to say, get out of the power struggle of what I call station two of relationships, different conversation. There's three stations, how they work, how it structurally works. It's a core structure of cosmos, the, these three levels. But, you know, you get out of the power struggle and you actually say, you know what? I need you. Not codependently. All right. I can actually look at KK and say like, wow, I need you. And I love you. I need you. And in Hebrew wisdom tradition, very beautifully, the infinity is understood as a not just the infinity of power, but what I call the infinity of intimacy. It's like, right? And the infinity of intimacy turns to us and places its attention on us and says, oh my God, I need you desperately. So this is the all-powerful force of cosmos who manifests cosmos because he, she, it, right? That power needs us in some way. So, So our sense of participatory relationship with infinity or imitatio day, depending on whether you're going for an Eastern or Western position, right? means that I can actually look at you and say, I love you, I need you, right? And it's not just interdependence, that's too palata a way of understanding. Yes, we're interdependent, but it's more than that. We desperately, desperately need each other. And it's only from the realization that your need is my allurement, that dignity is restored. Ordinary love is a stre- it's what we usually call love in Western culture. And, and we're in a strange position in relationship to love in Western culture. I mean, we've killed all the gods except for Aphrodite. Right? And that's, it's the god or goddess of love who, who still remains standing in a very beautiful way, a poignant way, but also a very tragic way. I mean, the World Trade Center goes down in this tragic, epic moment. And we know that the true value of a culture is always in the moment of death, right? Do you say, Om Mani Padme Om? Do you say, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, right? In other words, what your creed is always at that moment of death when you're, you're facing the ultimate in some way. So in that moment, and we've actually recorded, we've re- re- recovered those recorded sacred texts. What people said at that moment, we have people's iPhones, they said, I love you. That's what people said, mm-hmm. right? When people rest to their phones, they didn't say any other sacred creed that they said, I love you. That's what they, right? And so that's our sacred creed. And yet, you know, you remember, um, was it Thucydides in the Peloponnesian Wars, right? He says, when words lose their meaning, culture collapses. We're not quite sure what I love you means anymore. So actually, for example, I love you and I need you. You don't only say that to Ike. You say it in a particular way to Ike. But actually, there can be other people that you love. Right now, I don't mean romantically. I don't mean getting a U-Haul. I don't mean sexually. That's a whole other set of conversations that we're not having. But I mean that we've exiled love in three ways. One, we've made it a particularly human experience. It's a human, love is a human experience, as most, virtually all the literature understands it. It emerges at a certain point in the evolutionary history. Two, it's a particular human experience, which is actually much closer to infatuation. Right. And three, you're only allowed socially to have that experience with one person, three. And four, since that experience doesn't sustain itself, and at least certainly not in the initial way that it configured, your life is tragic. Right. I mean, that's basically the configuration of love. That's what I call ordinary love. Outrageous love reverse engineers all three of those exiles. And as I begin to understand that, Love is not mere human sentiment, right? Paraphrasing Tagore, right? Love is the heart of existence itself, right? Or Dante, right? It's the love that moves the sun and other stars, right? We call that either evolutionary love, meaning the love that animates or the eros, it's a return to eros, the eros that animates the evolutionary process. And again, eros has a very precise definition. It's a very precise formula. It, It appears in many ways, but it means something. It's not just a word. So the eros that drives evolution, evolutionary love or outrageous love, right, is the love that drives everything, that moves everything, right? It's the excitement of having a conversation right now, but it's what makes us create, right? It's what causes us to get up in the morning. It lives between everything. 
And that's the, the proton and the electron that are allured to each other, right, are, are loving each other. Now, we use different words for it because the nature and the quality of that experience evolves over time. That's the evolution of love. So the early attraction or repulsion dynamic in cosmos, which could also be called the autonomy communion, right, dimension, right? Because opposites are always joined at the hip as one of the core features of cosmos, right? You know, emerges through cosmos. It unfolds in a particular way and it, and it appears as love. So outrageous love is the quality that lives in me in which I participate in the evolutionary love force of cosmos that becomes awake and alive in me. That doesn't disappear. That gets deeper and more profound, more available. And that's the most hopeful ontological fact we could possibly imagine. Who am I? I'm an outrageous lover, but not in a cute way, right? Although it's a great term, right? It has nothing to do with sexuality. It's a whole different conversation as we said, important conversation, not the one we're having, right? So an out, what does an outrageous lover do? An outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. Which ones that are a function of his or her unique self? So it's not my job to run the seminar series you guys are running now. But you guys need to be doing it. So I get to meet you and hear, wow, you guys are running this beautiful thing and all these dimensions. And I get to be really excited about it. And I don't say, well, why am I not doing that? No, that, that's your outrageous act of love to do. And I get to be in mad devotion. So an outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love that are a function of his or her unique self. And then we come together in a not command control top down, but a bottom up self-organizing, self-actualizing cosmos. And we form unique self symphonies based on a universal score of music or grammar of value, which has radical diversity within the larger movement of the music. So now we just, we just, now we have a, a vision that we can actually build a society on. One would be unique self symphony that we actually, you know, just, just dropped into the space at the end. So that is to say the individual is a unique self. But the individual comes together and plays her, his or her instrument in a unique self-symphony. Now, in a unique self-symphony, and here's the key, there has to be an ability to hear each other's instrument. Every instrument, let's think about it in terms of value. Every instrument is a value. So to avoid polarization, right, I have to not only not externalize that which is inimical to my position, I have to not only not engage in, you know, participating in a broken information ecology, which we're basically engaged in various forms of information warfare, which has been going on forever, but is now based on exponential technology, undermining the core structures of democracy, we actually have to be able to inhabit each other's value. I need to feel your value, I need to hear your instrument. And if I play my instrument, but I'm tone deaf to your instrument, I'm actually going to undermine the symphony. So unique self symphony is a new, it's a, it's a new word we created because we need new language. We need, you know, subversive vocabularies. We need, this is Brandon's phrase, which I thank my friend Zach for, right? It's, it's a subversive, empowering vocabulary. And one of the things we're trying to do at the center is lay down a new field of language, right? But a field of language which we can actually identify with, which is actually rooted and resonant in kind of deep understanding. It's not sloganeering. So a unique self symphony is a communal form in which all the pieces have value, right? I mean, you've noticed maybe the last sentence, you've noticed the, um, like we all have, Andy, the, the intense polarization of the last you know, years. I want to blame Trump for all ills, and he's responsible clearly for a certain amount of them, but he's not responsible for all ills. And it's, it's a much more complex issue. That's a function of the polarization itself. But actually what happened was, in some sense, when the Cold War ended and we lost an ability to create an interior sense of identity, because what happens is most people create an identity by drawing a circle around them and placing someone else outside the circle, right? So I have the illusion of being inside the circle because I place someone else outside. So there's a false eros, or I call it a pseudo eros, a false interiority. As long as we had a Cold War, 
we could actually, we were involved in this epic, you know, world galactic struggle. And so whatever the differences were, we could handle it. You know, actually Richard Nixon and John Kennedy famously were close friends. They took a, a train trip together in 1947 and they remained close friends during their Senate years. Right. And there's actually a beautiful letter from Richard Nixon to Jackie right after, after John was assassinated. That doesn't exist today. Right. And I remember reading about it. I was just so delighted, right. To kind of hear about that friendship because, right. You feel the sanity of it. Even when you see, um, you know, George Bush Jr., you know, kind of um, talking to Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. you know, at John McCain's, you know, funeral, you get the sense of relief. But that that's not the nature of the discourse because we don't have a shared story and our ostensible enemy seems to have disappeared. And we didn't notice that actually the emergence of China, right, and the emergence of kind of Putin-like autocracies are actually posing, you know, a threat more real, actually, than the myth of the Soviet Union, but we haven't quite noticed that. And so we're defining ourselves, right, in opposition because we don't have an inner core of identity. And we're paradoxically, to use your terms, we're codependent on the pseudo eros of the polarized struggle to give ourselves identity. So codependency appears in multiple forms. There's subtle codependencies where I need to hate you in order to have an identity which is, by the way, part of how cancel culture works, but don't get me started on that. This is actually, it's a, it's a lot of fun to share. Um, I, I made this in like a long time ago. I'm actually a little embarrassed to share it, but, but lots of my friends still listen to it, actually. A particular movie maker, I won't tell you the name because it's recognizable, actually listened to this with his partner and made a very famous movie after he listened to this. He listened to it on a trip, you know, that they drove across country, which kind of inspired kind of a, a famous, you know, epic American movie. It's called On the Erotic and the Holy. Right? It's not about sexuality. It's about eros. It's the relationship between the erotic and the holy. I gave it, I believe, as a series of talks in Naropa. So it's, it's a little too fast. And <laughs> he's like, slow down. But it's, it's actually exciting. And although the ideas have iterated enormously since, and maybe the, the, the recent book I did with Christina Kincaid, Dr. Kincaid, A Return to Eros, is a, a later iteration. But the raw kind of structure of the whole vision of Eros is already in that book. And it's also, for those who are interested, it's deeply rooted there more overtly. I, I hit a lot of that in Return to Eros. It's more overtly rooted in the kind of mystery traditions of the West. That fragrance, which is a little more subtle and hidden in kind of you know recent writing and everything we're doing going forward is more, more apparent. But in the course, I think that Krista told me we, we wanted to share was a also a, a seminar called on the evolution of love. Mm -hmm. And it's also a kind of an iteration of some of these ideas, right? It talks about rageous love. It talks about ordinary love. It talks about relationship structures. It talks about second shock of existence. So some of these things are at play there. And that was, a, I believe it was a, we recorded it a couple of years back in about eight days. And it also has, you know, a lot of energy to it. I think I just want to apologize to everyone from this. I think I was wearing in it um, this Indian top that someone sent me that I was, I'm so embarrassed that I was wearing that now. So I apologize for, to everyone in advance for the Indian top, but you know, someone sent it to me and it was there and I picked it up and I was wearing it. But seriously, right. It covers some of the early basics out right, of some of these ideas and it's kind of alive and exciting and, and delightful. And I would be, you know, madly honored if you would, you would enjoy it. And it'll, It'll give you some core basics that are before and after. Meaning once you get those insights, it's like the, the map of the world actually changes.